let you guys sit down a bit. Basically, what we're going to talk about is what can a time-based analysis say in ransomware cases. So, first of all, also thank you for having us. It's our first talk together, and we're really happy to do this. Uh, does this follow or not? No, not yet. Let's do it this way. <laughs> So, about us, quickly, InfoGuard is uh, probably the largest Swiss-based MSSP and SOC provider. The CTI team, which is Yurina, also known as Structure, <laughs> and David, known as Chaos, um, have been working and were attached to the CSER team, the investigations team. We started in October 2021, so it's been a year now trying to get a grasp of a running engine, and a railroad engine. Um, so, the idea about this talk came out, we started mystifying the CSERT, re CSERT reports. And looking at them, we saw, we saw that we could actually start clustering activities together in the ransomware cases. So while we were looking at the different data sources, so basically the CSERT documents, we saw um, two primary ways of documenting the cases, and also the CSERT team has two temps. They have the client reports, which are more manager level, sort of a narrative, this is how the attack happened, the initial access, was there ransomware, or whatever the effect on target. And we had that sort of storyline, and then we have the Aurora files. The Aurora files is actually an open source tool that our boss, since it's our boss, we also have to do some publicity, um, is using, and it allows you to document as an incident responder quite clearly what's going on. One of the reasons that it's quite important for, for our CSER team is we try to get our, the initial infection point as far back as possible, knowing also that you have the different visibility and logs that may change the data. So right now, it's um, a standalone. It's a small application you can download. You can only use one user, can write at a time, but it's quite nice. And we hope um, that Aurora NG, the next generation, will be out by the end of the year, has also a um, small DB allowing for better element linkage and some background workers for continuous enrichment and also MISP synchronization. So this is probably one of the big things for us is we can send the documents from the IR case directly into a MISP that we pre-configure um, with the event that is attached to the attack. Am I missing anything? No. All good. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, one of the big preoccupations that we have is we read a lot, or as CTI practitioners, we read lots of things going to, from the internet storm or whatever the sources that we are, we have, and we see that we have different types of attackers. We have a QBot or CACBot, QuackBot. We see always uh, vulnerabilities. And then later on, we get called when there's an effect on target. So one of the big questions we have is always, what happens? Are there linkages between these two elements? the newspapers, the initial access, that could give initial access, and the effect on target. Does that make sense? If I speak too quick, just raise the hands and I'll try to slow down. So we've all seen cybercrime as a service. We see different offerings on different darknet markets, being them, be, uh, they can be outside on the clear net. We see things on the darknet. Um, but we don't always find the things, the cases that we handle. We don't see anything being sold there. We also have now the ransomware as a service, been going on for a few years. Um, we have the different types. Uh, this is just Lockbit, one of them. The pictures were taken before it was Lockbit 3, but it's always interesting to see how they market their things. Um, you get all these administrative panels in Tor system, automatic test description, automatic decryptor detection, how fast they encrypt, and all their funky, cool stuff. Um, so this was Lockbit 2, now we have Lockbit 3. It just got, it seems to be a pretty booming market. We're a bit afraid that it might let go a bit, but your arena will get back to that. So the presentation getting down is lies, damned lies, and statistics. So we know timestamps and data points. I mean, numbers are always cool. We think they're very objective. But we also decide which data we put in there. So before we go into the data set, it's a small sample of ransomware cases. So it's not the truth that we're bringing. It's the small visibility we've had with the ransomware cases that we'd like to sort of discuss and present. It's a more qualitative research approach because the data set is not that big. And we also have to remember that we can't compare attacks one to one because there's a difference in victim, topology, security systems, 
um, controls in place, the visibility of the, of the victim's logs. When we go in, what can we see? Are there any good logs? Or is it just dark and we try to have to find out what's going on? So, having said that, um, we've concentrated on the data, the time points, and the whole attacks. And I think... Oh, I have something to say. I still have to talk. <laughs> so, before we go on, we defined lateral movement. So, this is maybe not very orthodox. Um, but we, if we see lateral movements, a series of operations an attack it takes to compromise a network, and not just an atomic event as a login, and then trying to just expand a bit the beachhead or the initial axis, um, we start seeing clustering activities. And this, I think, or we believe, this can be used in ransomware cases because they're typically extremely noisy. Once the at, at ransomware affiliates say operators get in, they just go for the domain control or the backup server, and they just shatter all the glasses going through. So this gives us an interesting visibility. And as I was saying, it shows us um, the different activity clusters in the data. So here's one case. So this goes back to the... Um, this is from Aurora. This is one case. Um, it was a raccoon stealer. The victim, or an employee of the victim organization, went out, needed a software, got it a pirated version, but it was spiked with a malware, with raccoon stealer. And what we see... Um, Point zero is a sort of small CTI, or they check the, the registration of the C2. But first of all, what we see is the whole first step of the initial access. So it's the downloading, the installing of the pirated or spiked software, and then the activity until they have a first beachhead initial access in there. What we have, and what is quite interesting, is between the second part, it's a bit small, so I'll go on, but there are 12 days where there's no activity on the network. Though we have 290 hours between point one and point two. And the activity that the, the affiliate, if it's the same attacker or not, if it's somebody else from a ransomware, comes back at 9.30 in the morning, goes on, and 29 hours, or th practically 30 hours later, the victim network is totally encrypted. So this seems interesting. And if it's just one case, well, that's not much. But here we have another um, um, activity cluster. This is in the case of a VPN RDP access. What we see is somebody came in at point one, logged in, created a new user. And again, we don't have, we, let me go to the data points quickly. What we also see here is when we have the encryption, so it depends on the IR responders if they put in that data point or not. But if we go to the time points, between the initial axis, so that first number, number one up there, and the lateral movement, we have 56 days of no activity from any malicious actor on the network. And this seems intriguing for us, looking from, uh, from the outside, the, that there's a silence. And then, very quickly, in 18 hours, there, we just see full logs of activities, malicious activities going on until the encryption is done on the network. So this, seeing this, we see we're going through misbifying our data from the IR cases, and just going through that, and it keeps appearing these moments of silence on the network, and that got us intrigued. And I think with that, you. you're up. Thank you. So to make the data analysis possible, I want to sum up some definitions. Let's start with the initial access. So that's pretty clear. Uh, we take this as when an attacker gets access to a network. Uh, this was quite easy in the most cases to find in the timeline um, of the reports in Aurora files. Uh, however, for the lateral movement part, uh, it was a bigger challenge. So, as David already mentioned, we take this as a series of operations an attacker takes to compromise the network. And the effect on target was, again, a bit more clear. We take this as when the encryption step of the ransomware was executed. We also defined some access methods. First of all, the VPN and RDP access. This is when the attacker gains access to a network using credentials. And here we didn't focus on how the attacker got the credentials. Then the next one is vulnerability. Here the attackers gained access by pivoting on a vulnerability. And with Maldoc we summed up um, infections by usual suspects, such as Tridex, Emotet, Cockbot, etc. 
And finally, for a Raccoon Stealer, so when the user downloads pirated software, as David already introduced, um, we created an own group called Spiked Malware. <laughs> so now a few things about our data set. We took the uh, InfoGuard IR reports and Aurora files that you already saw, and we picked out uh, ransomware attacks. So we got 31 attacks uh, that took place between January 2021 and September 22, 20, 2022. <laughs> um, and we want to point out that, uh, again, the cases differ in network security configurations and also the attacker capacity. On this slide, you already see a time-based overview of the attacks. And we saw this and thought we should compare the year 2021 and 2022 a bit more detailed. So you can see this here. And the, one of the most interesting things uh, could be that the amount of cases dropped during the second quarter of 2022. We think that this can be because of the conflict in Ukraine and also ransomware groups uh, that have inside fights, such as we have seen in the, with the Contilix. And after the break of cases in the summer, we can already see a slight trend that the number of cases is already increasing again. So before we are dying, diving deeper in, into our data set, I want to present you two general findings. First one, we have about 52% uh, of, the, of the cases that had uh, initial access um, where the attacker got in via a VPN or RTP credential. And also about 52%, um, we have cases where the attacker, the attacks were facilitated, facilitated by Cobalt Strike. Now, speaking of Cobalt Strike, this leads us to the next finding. In the cases where Cobalt Strike was used, we can see, we can see a decreased median time from lateral movement to the effect on target. And you can see on the graph that we have um, for attacks with cobalt strike, we have um, 33 hours the median time, and if they don't, the attackers didn't use uh, cobalt strike, uh, we have nearly the um, factor of two. Uh, but again, please keep in mind we haven't compared the network complexity. You also might have noticed that we use the median instead of an arithmetic mean. This is because of the size of our data set and because we wanted to reduce the big effect of outliers. So we decided to use the median for all the following analysis. So now we are diving deeper into our data set. Regardless of its size, trends seem to appear. So you can see, for example, that the overall time from initial access to effect on target, so the like the whole attack, um, took uh, about 25 days. And for cases where the attackers used a vulnerability exploit to get into the network, um, this time frame took much longer than in all the other groups. And now we break up this analysis and look at the time frame between the initial access and the lateral movement. And here we can see a very similar pattern as before. The overall median time from initial access to lateral movement amounts to about 14 days. So this suggests that defenders have about two weeks to detect the attack and kick the attackers out, since there is, in most cases, only a single point of, point of entry. Obviously, this does not apply to VPN and RDP access, since the attacker used legitimate credentials, and so the defense team would need a more specific log analysis. And if you concern, again, the vulnerability exploit, the median time is, again, much higher than in the other groups. 
This could be, for example, because we have multiple attackers or um, we have initial access broker that are reselling the access. Now we look at the second part. And here again, we can see the same pattern, but we can see a drastic change in temporality. Before we were looking at days and now we have just hours. So the median time of stage is about 40 hours. In this short time frame, the IR team of Infogard was able to kick out some of the attackers, but it was, of course, more difficult and complex to do this than if they already uh, detected the attackers before this time frame. And now, being the attentive lo listeners you are, you might have noticed that the 14 days, so the time between initial access to lateral movement and the one and a half days, you can see here, uh, so the time between lateral movement and effect on target doesn't sum up to 25 days. So this is, again, obvious uh, downside of the median. And with this, I will give back the word to David, who will conclude our findings. So I think one of the things we can stay on this line a bit is, is the whole skew of the vulnerability exploits. Um, we can go slide maybe also before. The, it keeps skewing. It, it, we were, it was nagging us because there's such a difference. Why would the, the attackers be different? And we spent the last 48 hours going through the data again. I mean, it's not, first of all, we have to take, it's not a big case number, right? We have about five to six, depending on the data points that we have. So it's probably skewed in that direction. But we went over the data again, and we were thinking, why is this? Why is it, why is it so, so different? And luckily or unluckily, um, we had the, the 40 net or 40 iOS um, vulnerability come out. And the first cases coming in um, of clients or victims calling us or calling the CSER team. And what we saw is the first cases that were calling, the ransomware attackers were, were already in. So they exploited the vulnerability and were in. On the ones, that was last, uh, end of last week when it just came out. And those calling this week, well, it was exploited, but it's just dwelling there. Nothing is happening. So that sort of brings us, so one possibility is um, the vulnerability exploit is that um, it's less um, streamlined, the reselling of the access, that it would be one possibility, is that they don't know, they just go out and pawn everything, not ethically scanning the whole thing, but really badly and exploiting it, and then they're triaging it afterwards, and then they have to go find somebody to exploit it or resell that access. The one way that we did see that they do monetize the access in the vulnerability exploits is crypto mining. So we have cases, and I think this is maybe we have to say again, is that um, even if it's skewed and it's much larger in the time frame, um, the exploit was, ex or the vulnerability was exploited. It's not that you're okay and you can take time to patch. Somebody came in, exploited the vulnerability, and is there doing something, maybe not going into a very disruptive attack, but they are um, hijacking the resources of the company, for example, by doing crypto mining. So these are sort of the hypotheses that we have for the, the skewing, but again, um, this is a very large and sort of metadata analysis, and we're very happy to discuss this and sort of have your input if you're seeing the same thing or not. Um, so that's sort of what was an agus in the vulnerability part. I hope that sort of sounds like reasonable explanations. And for the small data set, please excuse us, but we can't do more than that. <laughs> so let's go to the last slide, maybe a few discussion points. Um, again, knowing this is not the truth, we have a small visibility, it's a small set of attacks. We also have the different network security configurations. Um, but we have this question, are there different resale times between different types of access? Um, going again, if we see the whole usual suspects, the dry decks, um, trick bot, and so whatsoever, it is possible that if, depending on their access, they're better at triaging who are their victims. And that may be easier to sell an access. If you're in a really big company that makes lots of money, you can sell that access for a higher price and more quickly, unless in, if you're just doing a complete exploit from a vulnerability and then triaging later, it will take you more time to sell that access. So this is a data point, but it's a thought. We're happy to discuss that. Um, we can go, yes. And then another hypothesis that we've had 
is the human resources. We all have human resources capacity problems. We're trying to find good people to do this. But do the attackers also have a human resource problem? And we've seen sa same ransomware uh, operators. So it ends up with a Conti or a Lockbit. But some of them are just clicking around and not getting any further. And then it takes a few hours. And then somebody is very good and goes forward. So. We also believe that there are different capacities from the different attackers. So there's a reselling that would support the idea that the attackers are, have different capacities, are reselling, and have a human resources problems just as we are. Um, this would also sort of suggest the late pickoff um, that we saw at um, Yorina slide over the yearly cases. Um, until last week, we had a very small, normally in you know, August, July, August, everybody's going to vacation, it's okay. And then September, it starts picking up. And this year was much slower. One possible I thought, I have no basis whatsoever, just sort of critically thinking about it, but are the situations in the in, in Ukraine and Russia with the drafting also pushing um, real sort of real world issues on the cyber actors that they have to deal with before moving on and getting back to business. So that's another possibility. One other data point that we did not have the time, again, we're a small CTI team, we're two people uh, with lots of data and things to do. But what we would like to also look is how does exfiltration impact the timeline? Do attackers that try to get as big as data as they, they want to, does that change how long they dwell before there's a ransomware? And that is also a question that we don't know. We haven't gone into the data. We could probably find it out. But not many victim um, organizations that we've seen actually tra uh, track the outgoing traffic so that we could say, well, at that point, this, traffic, this much traffic was ex exfiltrated. I think one of the big important points for defenders in general is there's a medium time of 14 days, of two weeks, where there's an active infection on the network. Um, so this is typically for the Maldox. Um, you have 14 days to find that Cobalt Strike beacon in 50%, 52%, 51.6% <laughs> of the cases. But to get that and kick them out before you have the hands-on attack, because when we see the attackers coming in, they're hands-on. They're back in there. And we've seen um, sometimes 12 hours of continuous ping on the keyboard until they get there. So and that's a, that's a... No, I'm not going to swear. It's too early in the morning. But that says it's a, it's a difficult moment when you get into as a CSER team when you have the hands-on keyboard because they will try to get their way and find back. But if in the for, those 14 days before the hands-on attack, we can kick them out or isolate the, the endpoint or the server, then we we gain so much time and we can avoid the disruptive effect. And maybe the very last point is. Enable MFA. Um, I know we're going to talk about MFA fatigue and so whatsoever, but I think that's not the, the, the thing. The external facing services, typically VPN and RDP, MFA will save so much time and damage. Um, so having said that, um, it sort of concludes the, the small uh, presentation we've had. We're happy to discuss. Um, we've quickly gone over the data. I speak very quickly. I'm sorry for that, but I'll try to speak more slowly during the question Q and A's. So, having said that, thank you. Unless you have something to add, okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah. Patrice Offret, Onif. Um, you say 52% of initial access were due to VPN, RDP uh, credentials, uh, I think. Do you have some data about the number of initial access with exploiting critical vulnerabilities? We, we didn't have the time to do what we. The difficulty we've had is um, is the victim a data set. So we don't have that data. So I'm sorry to say, no, we'd love to. Uh, if you have more data to exchange, or we, we can discuss afterwards, but that would be an interesting data point. Very true. Thank you. And sorry. Uh, thank you, too. I have a question for the vulnerable exploited servers. Did you see that uh, those servers get exploited several times, and could this maybe have an effect yes. on the timeline? Yes. Um, Although we took the initial, um, so again, we took the initial, this was a big discussion we had in the last 48 hours. Do we take the moment that we see a real difference in movement or not? Uh, one case was we saw the crypto miner in there about two months. And then suddenly there's a change in the PowerShell uh, downloading. 
So something switched there, and that's where we believe the lateral movement and then the encryption came on. But it's difficult to go in through that data to say this is exactly that point. So we decided to take the, really the initial compromise moment in the vulnerability um, point. So again, uh, because we want, also want to, do it, to really underline that point that um, it's not that the vulnerability is not exploited, it's just exploited by somebody probably else. But you're totally correct. In many cases, we have multiple actors when there are vulnerability exploits. I just have one question. Yes. Um, you say 14 days um, when a function could be caught and contained. So does it mean that each organization has 14 days for doing detection engineering and to do proper detections? <laughs> Good call. Um, probably in many of the victim networks, um, I mean, if you're a bigger company, there could be a possibility to, to, to get those 14 days. On the smaller ones, not. Um, then again, it also, I mean, we have so many Cobalt Strike beacons in the data set, and I don't know how good we are at sharing them. Um, we're not that far yet that we can share, or we, we haven't automated that process. But I think those cobalt stri strike beacons would be really good. Uh, although there might be a shift from cobalt strike to another framework. But th those 14 days, it just, it shows there's a dwell time. And I think this is the interesting part. Awesome. Maybe your last questions? <laughs> um, yeah, just some thoughts about what you said about the Ukraine and uh, shifting in human resources, and etc. Uh, there are also some articles saying about there is some sirens before the storm in September, before they are going to hit Europe with some several key locations because it's winter and it's the perfect time to unleash stuff. If there is some data to share some indicators of attacks or other samples, um, I'm an incident responder. <laughs> I would be happy to have this on my network and see if we can feed our DRP plants on the same yeah, moment if we see something, it's something to think about up forehand because I'm actually waiting for stuff to happen during the winter. There's a possibility, but I think, oh, okay. <laughs> um, we were also, last, last week, we're like, should we put in October or not? We didn't have any cases. And, um, well, we've seen at least the 40, 40 OS um, vulnerability has just pushed up the attackers seem to be back. So we've had multiple calls uh, in the last, since Friday night. So it seems that summer is finally over, although we have very good weather right now in Europe. It's rather warm for this time of season, but I think it's over. So on the malware uh, criminal side, activity seems to be picking up. That doesn't exclude what you were saying. But yeah, that would be a happy discussion if we see things and how do we share that, oh, there's a back of activity this is an important thing. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you do this, if you are, it's not related to technical information, but can you also, do you have some details regarding the time that attackers take to reply to the victim when they try to contact them? Because you mentioned that there are from time to time a human resource issue on their site. Mm -hmm. So do you have some numbers? They take a few days, a few hours so, you know, to, to respond to some inquiries or at least okay what's the ransom price uh can you submit some samples to see the decryptor works and stuff like this you have some facts so um what we did see so we d we didn't do this is not part of this analysis but what we see in general is we have a three to five percent of the ransomware um how do you say um cost is typically between the three and five percent of the how do you say general revenue of a company so they seem to be uh, they know what company they attacked because it's between that uh, segment. Then um, I think it's very affiliate, and this would actually support that we have different types of operators and attackers be behind there. We have some that are very polite, some who are extremely uh, disagreeable. Um, there are some that res respond very quickly and some who don't know how to respond. Um, so I think, again, this sort of supports more... It, 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 we would need much more cases to sort of see how are people replying and um, in which speed and what are the words are they using? Can we do a syntaxic or a linguistic analysis, semantic analysis of the coming back? That's all I can say. So what we see is the difference in attackers and operators and ransomware, different people use it. Or 
a contour or lock bit, I'm just saying as an example, but some families are the same and the replies are very different in the attitudes and in the timing, which would support um, different uh, ransomware as a service the way we see it from the outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting.